This is the Market Sit Rep, where we talk macro, micro, charts, and anything else that matters to markets. I'm Tyler from Foundation Investing, and let's get started. We're going to start off this week's show with macro. And for the macro segment, we're talking about, you guessed it, China. So China's been all over the news. It's why the S&P has been falling this year. Markets are shaky. They don't know what to think. So let's just look at the dynamics of what's happening over there. So far, what we see is a country that has had a huge run-up in the last 10 to 20 years. Monumental. But don't mistake it for command economy competence. Okay, The Communist Party is not the reason why China has done so well. They've simply just taken out a ton of debt and invested it into terrible projects that are going to lose money in the long run for short-term gains. So people have been obsessed with this narrative that China is going to rise as the leader of the global stage and overthrow U.S., the fading star, and become a global reserve currency status, something of that nature. And that's just simply not true. Communist economies are fragile at their core. Okay, and this is, this is key because the contract between the people and the government needs to be extremely well taken care of and manicured and cultivated. Because if that trust, if that trust between the two, the, the government and the people blows up, everything goes straight down. They don't have a means of electing peacefully a new regime. So back in the Cold War times, pundits thought that Oh, it's the Soviet way of doing things is the best. Look how well they're doing. Look at all the growth. No, it's just because of ridiculous spending, too much debt. It all blew up in their faces, and look what happened to them. So just to be clear, though, we do get similar behaviors in democratic regimes as well, but it's just much, much easier to have a soft landing because when crises hit, people can elect new governing bodies, and people can move on. And in socialist or communist countries, that tie between the people and the government is a lot more fragile, and it could just snap, just snap like a twig like that with, with just a little wrong tweaking or just a, too hard of a landing. So now let's get back to the numbers and the economics. So it's been staggering, right? Millions out of poverty. We shifted global trade eastward. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a huge success story so, so far. And much, of this, and much of this building has been financed by debt, both public and private, as we said. So if you take out this, check out this graph here, you can see that increase in credit to private sectors, percent of GDP. China's over there on the right. Uh, people, the private sector has been borrowing like mad over there. And this next piece right here, this next graph, you can see, this is a Bloomberg graph, it's pretty cool. You see China's corporate and new household debt as percent of GDP, that's the white line. And then China's debt servicing costs as percent of GDP. So as those yellow lines creep higher, that means more of their GDP has to go just to servicing prior debt. And this is where the whole downward spiral can start. Because when you're spending too much of your income on debt servicing and not on productive activities, you end up slowing down growth. And then next thing you know, you can't hold your interest payments anymore. People start selling your debt and we have a whole downward spiral. So what has all this debt spending done? Well, it's, it's basically created a recipe for the most egregious capital misallocation of all time. So since the mid-90s, we've had the Chinese yuan has been be appreciating against the U.S. dollar by the People's Bank of China via crawling peg. Okay, so they've been managing this peg to make sure that the Chinese currency is considered stable and safe. Okay, so this dependable appreciation with coupled with the loose, incredibly loose fiscal spending of the government created an environment where businessmen, analysts, and policymakers could pursue ventures and not even care about the downside risk. Okay, and they, they, don't, even, they don't even know what that downside is anymore. They, they've been sheltered from the reality of capital risk. You see these state-owned enterprises in China, as soon as stuff gets shaky, the government, boom, they just come in and bail them out again. So the people running these companies just don't understand risk. They're not allowed to fail. They're not allowed to take a hit. And everything's just been keeps on propping up by taking out even more and more debt. And at this point, the, the deleveraging has begun. The jig is up. Their growth is slowing. They can no longer justify all the debt spending. Those servicing costs are creeping up in terms of the amount of money that they have to service each year, and that's a strain. So at this point, the government tries to push in even more money to the system, but they can't because 
it's already saturated with debt. And this is what we call the pushing on the string effect. So when there's just so much debt and stimulus already in the system, when you add more, the marginal benefit's basically nil. And that's the position China's in right now. On top of that, this is timing with the biggest USD bull market in 20 years. So we have dollar strength tightening monetary conditions. And we also see China's competitors like Japan and Juan, you can see in this chart here, China's at the bottom, the other Asian countries are at the top here. They've been actively devaluing their currencies to stimulate their markets. So this is just a huge, huge problem with them. And, and they basically have two choices now. They can undergo large debt deflation and take the pain, or they can just devalue their currency and inflate a lot of the debt away. And here's the kicker. Governments throughout history, every single time choose the inflation route. And you know why? It's just, it's an easier route to go. Okay, and especially for in a command economy where that social contract between them and the people is so fragile and important, they're definitely going to choose the inflation route because you can't allow the, the economy just to go down to the tank, not do anything about it, and the wealth effect disappears, people get upset, and there's revolt. So they don't really have a choice. They're going to have to devalue the currency somehow to pay for a lot of this debt and protect against all the capital outflows that are coming out of the country because they're afraid of this debt to begin with. So right now, Chinese FX reserves are around, let's call it 3.3 trillion on an absolute basis. Now, people say that's a lot, but in reality, it's not. So the a reliable metric here is FX reserves to M2. And right now, that's at a, about a 15%. So the amount of reserves they have to M2 money supply is 15%. To put that in context, during the Asian financial crisis, in 97, the Asian Tigers had an M2 base around 20 to, 5, 20 to 25%. So they even had more reserves relative to their M2 than China has now. So there's not nearly as, many, as much ammunition as you think, not even close. Okay, And the average devals for these countries in 97 was, you guessed it, 60%. Okay, So China, China has a long way to go here with getting their country in tandem with something, with the, with the currency crisis that we've seen back in the 90s. So they can basically defend here for a while, blow through the reserves, and we already see them dropping. Just, if you check out a graph, the reserves, they've been blowing through them. Or they can devalue right now with reserves from a position of strength and have a sizable FX buffer. Now, we think if they devalue now from a position of strength, that's just a, a much better call for them. They can manage their, their currency up there at the, the devalued rate. They don't have to worry about the market blowing through them. Rather than having the market force them liquidate all the reserves, and then they devalue with nothing left to control. So that's kind of what's going on in China from a macro perspective. So why does this matter to U.S. investors? So, well, a 50% yuan devaluation sends a tidal deflation across the world. So USD price, USD would soar and prices around the world would collapse, including commodities. Also, commodity producing countries like Australia would take a hit. Their markets would take a hit. And because this USD soaring in relation to yuan and other currencies creates a deflationary effect, that's going to have downward pressure on our markets as well, and especially since our markets are at record high valuations. So the combination of deflation, falling prices, and collapsing demand is the last thing you want in a world with debt up to their eyeballs. So this is why this, this dynamic is so important. This is why you see investors in Wall Street reacting to the overnight moves in China, and this is why you need to pay attention to them too, because if they go and do a devaluation, that's really going to matter in terms of what we want to be looking at, what we want to be invested in. Definitely now, it's, it's not to have a lot of risk on the table. It's, it's, it's being defensive mode. And we'll talk a little bit later about what we can possibly do to position ourselves in a defensive manner. And now on to micro. And today we're going to talk about America's favorite stock, Apple. Apple Computer Incorporated. So we've been writing about this to the bear side for quite some time now. We've got a ton of flack all over the internet. Because whenever you go against America's favorite stock, you're going to get the trolls. They're going to come out and they're going to get you. But regardless of what they said, we ended up being right after the latest earnings report confirmed our thesis. And our thesis is pretty simple because the Apple store is pretty simple. And it has to do with the key drivers, which are their iPhone sales in China. And it's because their iPhones are two-thirds of their revenue. And China is because that's where they're trying to get their growth from. So they're banking on, and Wall Street's banking on, them selling as many iPhones as they can over in China. Now, judging from what we just heard about China, does that seem probable? Nope. Uh, not probable at all. 
and they came out with their earnings report and they proved us exactly right. China's growth is not up to par with what Wall Street wants. It's just that simple. So you're seeing Apple go through this little transition right here. People are unsure if it can continue to be the stratospheric growth stock that it has been. It might be transitioning more into a yield play. Okay. So you can see on this chart here, uh, the latest earnings, we saw that gap down to new 52 week lows. And that's why the, the earning report came out. The growth numbers for China weren't that great. It sells off. So we've been playing this to the short side. We think it continue could, uh, could go down or maybe trade in the sideways range, but it's just, it's not looking good. If we dig into the report specifically, check out this slide, the currency index that they created to show how badly FX is hurting them. So in Q4 2014, $100 of revenue then is was worth only about $85 now. And that's due to all currencies across the world weakening against the US dollar. So Apple's is extremely exposed right now to foreign country risk and FX risk because they, they're not growing in, in the US anymore. They've basically saturated this market. So all their growth comes from outside the US. And outside the US, that picture doesn't look too hot, especially China, who's on the midst of what could be uh, one of their biggest crises in 20 years. So Apple is not in a good position right now in terms of growth. And if you look at their uh, constant currency revenue growth statement, they did something pretty cool here. They're trying to massage the numbers and say, hey, look, what if uh, the constant currency stayed the same? And the numbers are a little bit better, but not that much. You see Greater China uh, had a 17% mark instead of a 14%. And so that's all right, but uh, they're, they're trying to tell us here that it's mainly FX that's been hurting them. So we do agree with that, but we also think it's, it's much more than that. We're seeing an actual global slowdown, and that's really going to affect Apple's growth. So it's not a bad company. Apple's still going to make tons of money. They're still going to be highly profitable, but they're just not going to have that growth that we're used to seeing, where they just go straight up. So they could trade sideways to down, be more of a yield value stock, and... You know, until they decide to make a big move, we don't expect it to really go anywhere and, and to rebuild that quality Apple growth narrative. And that's it for micro today, and let's move on to technicals. All right, everyone loves charts, right? Let's look at SPY, the spiders. We see they're in a nice range here. We haven't really gone anywhere. We're looking for this support line to break at the bottom, but not after a rally or retrace. Call around the 200 area, so we think this will come up probably fall back down. And the reason why is we see a lot of what we call bear market rallies. So in a bear market, nothing ever goes straight down. We come down, we have a brutal rally that restores hope, and then we roll over again. And that's what we're thinking in SPY right now. Boeing, BA, Boeing Co., the big airplane manufacturer. This is hanging right on a support. They had a bad earnings report, came down near the 120 area. And this is a great candidate to short below this level, probably after it retraces a bit with the market. So be on watch for BA, Boeing. It's going to probably come up to around the 130 area. And then when it peels back down, look to either sell if you're long or possibly get short. Next up is my favorite instrument right now, bonds. Okay, and these are the bond futures, ZB. And the reason why we like it so much because we're in long and we're up money on it. And we bought this breakout right here of this triangle, this symmetrical triangle. And bonds have a lot going for them right now on the fundamental side. So we feel like this is definitely an ad candidate. If we get a pullback ad on any sort of move back down to the original breakout area, I think this thing could break highs and go all the way up here, especially in this environment where we have Bank of Japan continuing at low rates into the negative zone. U.S. bonds just look very attractive compared to the rest of the world. And let's look at dollar here. So here we got dollar index, and it's been quite a choppy trade lately. We've been range bound. Not a lot of money made on either side of this as everyone gets, keeps getting stopped out. But this is a basically no trade zone. You don't want to be initiating long or shorts within congestion areas because they typically just chop you up, frustrate you, and keep you outlaying capital into things that aren't moving. So dollar is a watch. If it gets back above this area again or maybe sets up a nice consolidation pattern to buy up higher, we'll be interested. But for now, it's a sideline trade. And finally, crude oil. Everyone knows about the crude oil drop here. We fell a massive amount from hundreds all the way down to the 30s. 
and have since been surprising everyone and their mother and just continued to fall down, down, down. A lot of people thought there was no way that we could see crude oil 30, but we thought it was possible. We shorted in the 42 area. We covered about half our position we're still in. Right now on crude, I'd look for this congestion zone right here to get taken out to the upside. If that does, then the bearish case isn't as strong anymore. But until we get that, that break above, I expect this thing to keep rolling lower. Even if we do get that break above, we expect another setup to occur to the short side again. We're targeting crude all the way down to the 16 handle. So trade them to the upside, pull them to the downside, but keep your keep your tight keep your stops relatively tight because this thing's pretty volatile here and it can move eight to ten percent a day. You don't want to be stuck sitting in a trade here and just gets away from you. I mean this thing could easily go to fifty as well. Crude's extremely volatile. So keep track of your positions. It's still in a downtrend, air on the short side, but be safe. That's it for this week's Market Sit Rep. I'm Tyler. This show's produced by Foundation Investing and thanks for watching. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or want to see something covered next week, feel free to contact us, foundationinvesting.com. We read every single comment. We like to incorporate stuff from our audience. I'll see you then. Thank you.